and welcome to this video. Uh, this is the OCRA Atomic Structure and Isotopes Revision video. Uh, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from AlloyTutors.com. Uh, and in this video, like I say, we're going to go through the, just give you a quick overview of the atomic structure and isotopes part for the OCRA specification. Um, the PowerPoints that I'm using here, um, you can um, purchase these PowerPoints. If you just click on the link in the description box below this video, you'll be able to get them there. They'll be great for things like revision, um, adding to your notes, etc. You can use them um, on your phone or the tablet on the way to school or college or anything. So there'll be um, there's just an, another way, another bit of material for you to revise from. All right, like I say, these things are based on the specification. So as you can see, obviously these are the specification points, um, and this one is directly linked to the OCRA specification. Okay, so um, just to remind you as well, this one's from um, module two, obviously this bit here. Okay, so it starts off looking at the atom. Okay, so we need to know the structure of the atom. The atom is made of protons and neutrons, as you can see in the middle here. They're really small relative to the full size of the atom. We have negative electrons orbiting round in shells, and these take up most of the space of an atom. The charges of these things, proton is a relative charge at plus one, its mass is one, relative mass. The neutron zero, its relative mass is one. This is basically just the, the mass relative to each other. And the electron has got a charge of minus one. Uh, and its relative mass is one over 2,000. You can't just put zero because an electron does have a mass. It's just very, very small. Um, you can probably remember these as a proton, positive proton for positive charge. Neutron neutral for, neg uh, for neutral charge. So um, you could probably um, remember it in that way. Okay, obviously in the periodic table you have your elements and you have two numbers in these elements here. The top number, uh, or sometimes it might be the other side actually, so we'll say the bigger number. The bigger number is called the mass number. Uh, it tells us the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. Uh, and the smaller number tells us the, it's called the atomic or the proton number. And this basically just tells us the number of protons in the nucleus. Um, and also in atoms as well, it's really important to know that the number of protons equals the number of electrons in atoms. Uh, and if you want it to work out the number of neutrons, all we do is you subtract your um, 7 minus 3, and obviously that will tell you the number of neutrons in an atom. Okay, so let's look at ions and isotopes. So ions are um, basically atoms that have lost or gained electrons, um, and they have a different number of electrons and protons. They're not the same, unlike an atom. So, for example, here's oxygen. Oxygen is in group. Uh, six. It has six electrons in its outer shell. Um, so to gain a full shell of electrons, um, it would need an extra two electrons to get the full eight, and then it would attract to a positive charge to form a stable compound. Um, we can see oxygen here. Oxygen is eight protons with a charge of plus eight. Eight neutrons, obviously that doesn't have a charge, and the ion has ten electrons charge of minus two. So if we do, do minus 10 plus eight, that gives a total charge of minus two. So um, this is obviously a negative charge. And this would bond to something that's positively charged, something like sodium. Uh, it has 11 protons, charge of plus 11, 12 neutrons, no charge, 10 electrons, its charge is minus 10. Obviously, because it's got one more proton than it does electron, its total charge is plus one. Now these two kind of you bond together and form a much more stable compound. Um, so that's pretty uh, pretty useful, and you see them a lot. That's an ionic bond. Right, isotopes are a little bit different. So these are elements with the same number of protons, but they have a different number of neutrons. Okay, so this is going to make it um, obviously a little bit heavier. Each of the isotopes. So let's have a look at these isotopes here. These are three different types of carbon twelve, um, and um, three different types of carbon isotopes. Sorry, we have carbon twelve carbon-13, carbon-14, uh, and obviously we've got the, the proton number or the atomic number on the bottom. Now what I've done is I've written down the uh, number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in each one of these, um, and there's some things that we need to point out. So if you look on the top one, these things have the same number of protons, all of these do, but the number of neutrons is different. If you look, we've gone from six neutrons here, seven neutrons here, eight neutrons here. Okay, so these are called isotopes, so make sure you be able to recognize them. Okay, we need to know about the history of the atom as well, how the atom has developed over time. So we've got this timeline here. We're going to start way back in 1803. John Dalton, he came up with the idea of spheres. He said that all atoms were spheres uh, and you just had different types of spheres, different sizes. And that's basically what he came up with. So he had a first go at it. Obviously, 
we don't we know this is not true now um uh, but back then it was accepted and until we had in 1897 so um just over 90 years later, we had J.J. Thompson. Uh, he had another go at it, and he kind of amended John Dalton's idea uh, and came up with a new model. Uh, basically, he discovered the electron. Uh, he said the atom wasn't solid uh, and was made up of other particles, and he called it the plum pudding model. So he said that you had negative, uh, negative electrons, which are these yellow circles here, and we had the positive pudding bit. So um, I have no idea what a plum pun would look like but obviously it must look something like this um so he, he basically came up with this idea and he tried to explain um his model obviously in a more um less abstract way by coming up with the word plum pudding uh, a little bit later on 1909 ernest rutherford okay so he developed thompson's idea it wasn't so much of a gap now he discovered the nucleus and he said that actually this nucleus is really small uh, and it was positively charged, and he, he basically said it was really small compared to the rest of the atom. He said it was mainly empty space, and it was made up of some negative cloud, he said. So it was just like a cloud of negative stuff around a positive, um, very small nucleus. And he had some evidence, actually, to back this up. Um, he used a gold leaf experiment. And uh, basically what he did is he fired alpha particles at a thin bit of gold leaf. Most of them went through, um, which suggested that most of the atom was empty space. Um, some of them were deflected, which means they were kind of, because alpha particles were positively charged, they deflected away from the nucleus. That told them it must have been a positive nucleus. And some, very, very, very few, bounced straight back towards where the alpha particles were being fired at. And that basically suggested that this nucleus was absolutely tiny, because not many of them were actually being completely uh, fired back at him. So basically that was his evidence, and he used this gold leaf experiment. Uh, a little bit later on, 1913, Niels Bohr, right, he said, well, actually, there's an issue, this is a problem. He said, how can you have a cloud of electrons around a positive nucleus? The cloud of electrons just collapse, because obviously, nucleus was positive, and the electrons were negative, so they would attract each other, it would just collapse into the atom. So, what he said, was he said, actually, um, we must have something else, and not something else was fixed energy shells. So, Niels Bohr, came up with the idea of energy shells. So this is the model that we're getting a bit, little bit more familiar with now. So, and actually he could prove it. He said when the EM radiation is absorbed, so this is electromagnetic radiation, the electrons can move between the shells. And when they do that, they emit this radiation when the electrons move down to lower shells. And he measured um, this, um, this kind of emission that was coming from the atoms. And the only way he could describe this was using this shell theory. Now you couldn't do it with a cloud model. So um, that's pretty. Uh, that's pretty important. Okay, the atomic model today. Obviously, electrons don't have the same energy in the shells. Obviously, nowadays we now we've got now we know that we've got subshells, um, and this basically explains the ionization trends. Okay, so the trend um, which we'll see um, later on in this in this module. Okay, so obviously we know we've got subshells like P, S, D subshells, etc. Okay, your definitions, right? You really do need to know these definitions, apart from this bottom one in the red, but you do need to know all the rest of them. So we've got, let's have a look at this blue one. This is called the relative atomic mass, okay, or the AR. Basically, this is the weighted mean mass of an atom uh, of an element compared to one twelfth of the mass of a carbon-12 atom. So um, this is basically the uh, the, uh, the the mass of something like an atom, for example. The relative isotopic mass, this is the mass of an atom of an isotope compared to one twelfth of the mass of an atom of carbon-12. So this is basically the mass of an isotope that makes it up. Notice they're kind of, they're very similar in terms of um, one twelfth of the mass of an atom of carbon-12. Very, very important. And relative molecular mass, um, this might be a bit useful, you don't have to remember this definition for, um, for OCR but it's just the mean mass of a molecule compared to one twelfth of the mass of an atom of carbon-12. Basically, everything was measured uh, against carbon-12. Okay, so um, that was like the reference uh, element that they used. Hence the word relative. Okay, so let's look at mass spectra. So mass spectra is a way in which we can measure 
the um, the mass of isotopes in an element. And I just want to kind of walk you through the, the graph and show you what we've got here. Okay, So looking at the bottom here, this is called the MZ. And the MZ is the mass to charge ratio. Um, basically, this is the mass of the isotope divided by its charge. Now, when it goes to a mass spectrometer, the uh, elements lose an electron. Um, and when they lose this electron, obviously, they form a positive charge. Now, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, only one electron is knocked off, so we only form a one plus charge. So when we do the mass of the isotope divided by one, we just get literally the mass of the isotope. So most of it is plus one charge, uh, and this is basically the same as the isotopic mass. So for example, 37 is the MZ here. We can basically assume that is the mass of the isotope as well, or the relative mass. Along the side here is percentage abundance. This is given as a percentage uh, abundance of the isotope in the sample. So obviously abundance is the amount of something. So the higher the abundance, the more of it you've got. Now, sometimes it's shown as a percentage, in which case it would be out of 100. Sometimes it might be a nominal value. So it'll just be called relative abundance, in which case you just add up all the isotopes and that'll tell you obviously what to divide it by, which you'll show, see in a minute. Okay, so they must add up to give 100. There we go, 75, we've only got two isotopes here, 75%, 25%, so they add up to 100. Okay, this spectra, like I say, shows two isotopes. We've got one element, but two isotopes. 75% of isotopes with a mass of 35, 25% of the isotopes with a mass of 37. So this is assuming they all have a one plus charge. Obviously, that's the assumption we're taking, and most of them will. And so from this, actually, we can work out the relative atomic mass, and we're going to have a look at that next. Okay, so let's have a look how we can work this out. So the relative atomic mass can be worked out by taking the abundance of A, multiply it by the mass to charge of A, plus the abundance of B times by the mass to charge of B, etc. So here we've only got two isotopes, but if you had three or four or five, you literally just repeat these bits and just keep adding them up. Divide it by the total abundance. Now in this case, the abundance is percentage, so it's out of 100, but yours might not be. Um, yours might be a relative abundance, in which case you just add the total abundance for each isotope and put that number at the bottom there. In this case, we're using percentage. So relative uh, relative atomic mass, 75 times 35, which is that, times that. 25 times 37, which is 25 times 37. Multiply them two. Divide by 100, because it's a percentage abundance, and we should get 35.5. We can use the periodic table, and we can identify the element as chlorine. If you look at the periodic table, you should see the mass that has 35.5 is chlorine. So pretty useful actually. All right, this is a different way of doing it. Uh, this is just using one with a table. Again, we've just got isotopes and we've got abundance. Uh, you can see we've got a few isotopes in this one um, and we've got the abundance of each. Again, it's out of a percentage. So let's have a look. Relative atomic mass, 70 times 20.5 times uh, plus 72 plus 27.4, blah, 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 blah. Right, all the way along. Basically, we're just multiplying these two that times that, plus that times that, plus that times that, etc. All the way along, divided by 100 because it's a percentage abundance, so that's the total amount. Now, if we put that in our calculator, we should get the answer to be 72.6. And again, if we look in the periodic table, we should be able to identify the element as germanium, or GE. So you can check that out and have a look in the periodic table. And that's it. That is um, the little quite small topic on atomic structure and isotopes. Um, please remember to subscribe to my channel if you just click on um, the middle button uh, right now. Um, and remember you can t purchase these uh, PowerPoints if you like from the link in the description box. Just click on that link there and you can get a hold of them. Great for revision. All right, that's it now. Bye bye.